Hello everyone. Happy uh, pre-Labor Day. Happy Sunday. I uh, wanted to reach out to you this evening, well this afternoon I should say, because our technology didn't work this morning at church. And so we are uh, actually going to, I'm going to share my sermon here today. I'm going to share my message with you uh, today. I'm just double checking technology to make sure things are working here and it looks like things are working so we're gonna go ahead and go with it so if you will join me this morning uh, for prayer as we begin father thank you that you love us enough to comfort us with the truth in love I pray the Holy Spirit will speak to my heart and to your heart and the heart of every single person who is listening that each of us would make a fresh new commitment, Father, to go about our work and our service in the spirit of a servant, recognizing it is your work, that we're working for you. You are the Master and Lord. These are, 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 are persons whom you love, that we are working with, and that we are going to, that we are going to trust you for the reward in due season. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the message today is about Labor Day. We are celebrating Labor Day here in just another day. And so, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about work. And so, when you think of the word job, when you hear the word job, you know, it, it, it really, uh, for many people, different things come to mind. You might think, oh, I'm so glad I have off work tomorrow. I'm glad it's a vacation day. Other people may be thinking, you know what? I'm thankful that I have a job. I'm thankful that I have a place to go and make money tomorrow. Or, you know, I sure wish I could find a job. That's what other folks can say. Or if you're like the seven dwarves, hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work we go. <laughs> but here are a few quotes that I found when preparing uh, for our message this morning about what people think about working in America. Every day I get up and I look through the Forbes list of richest people in America. And if I'm not on that list, I have to go to work. <laughs> and the world is divided into people who do things and people who get the credit for them. And then lastly, in any organization, there will always be one person who knows what is going on and one person, that person, must be fired. So um, there's a lot of cynicalists, you know, there's a lot of people who are thinking cynically about work. And, you know, the last thing, the last quote that I found is it's, if, if hard work is the key to success, most people would rather pick up and actually pick the lock for that. So do you remember, do you remember your first job? I remember mine. I actually had a couple. Uh, first of all, I remember when I was just a young a young kid, maybe 11 or 12, I worked in my neighborhood. I lived in an, a, the Italian section of Altoona. And I worked for the Papettis and the Morellis and the Grables and all these different folks who needed their grasses, you know, their grass cut and their, um, their hedges trimmed and uh, snow shoveling, things like that. And, um, my first job didn't pay well. Well, actually, it paid too well actually, because I was paid in Italian food. So, you know, I would have like pasta vajol or I would have a Scots or, you know, any sort of like Italian cookie, depending on the season, you know, the pizzelles and stuff like that. And I really loved it very, very much. And then I also had another job. And this was my first actual filling out the W-2, going through that. I worked for Weiss Market here in Altoona, the one over by um, Haas's there. And I uh, interviewed for the position, and Ralph Walker was the boss there. He was the manager. Loved that guy. Loved that guy so much. And the first, uh, the first week of the job, I told him, I said, I am terrible at math. Please, whatever you do, do not put me on register. I will stock your shelves. I will do all sorts of things for you. And what does he do? He puts me on the express lane, and I'm ringing register. And again, I'm terrible at math, but you know what? It's... All those things are automated, but I ended up falling in love with it. And the one thing that this has taught me 
was God is working through our work. And what I mean by that is, you know, I think it prepared me for future roles. I think it prepared me for, you know, dealing with people, for for um, uh, preaching the good news of Jesus, for, um, you know, being able to teach you. And, you know, I, I think that God teaches us through, um, through our work. I really do. And, you know, he had all these folks come through my line, and I, I just loved listening to them, and I loved hearing their problems and talking with them. And that work prepared me for the future. And so today we're going to talk about labor. We're going to talk about work. And I'm wondering, okay, I have my Bible there. I just want to make sure I have my Bible because we're going to need that. You know, a few of you who may be listening today may be retired. And that's fine. You can still take something from this message. And here's what I'll tell you. Um, stay active, stay busy, and find ways to pass along whatever that knowledge is, whatever that skill set is, whatever you were good at. Be a mentor, teach, encourage, never stop working. It could be volunteering, it could be reaching out, it could be just being there for someone else in need in our community, using your skills and talents in another way. And so this morning in the service, I had shared Paul Johnson, Pastor Paul. Um, he is one of those guys who, he's been retired for a while from, from being a pastor, and also he worked for the telephone company. And I'm so thankful that while he's retired, he could still be my mentor. He could still be the one who helps me when I have questions and when I'm learning. And, and so you know, even though he's retired, you know, and his life has changed a bit, he's still teaching. He's still educating. He's still um, encouraging. I love that man. And so let me ask you, so what about work? How does work fit into being a Christian? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus and be a worker? For many of us, work is just something that we do, you know, to get a paycheck. We got to pay the bills. We got to feed the family. You know that situation. We got to do it to live. But what if we all decided that we didn't want to work? What if we all decided that we weren't going to do that? We weren't going to get up at 5 a.m. and go into the office or, you know, go get in a truck and, you know, go get up on the roof, whatever it might be. You know, there are people in this world who simply stop working. And so how are we as Christians to wrestle with these types of attitudes and these types of things in our life? And so just a little bit of background as we get ready to dive into that topic. Let's talk about the history of Labor Day. As you know, we're going to celebrate Labor Day tomorrow. And Labor Day is the first Monday in September, always. And I think it was past, um, boy, first of all, I think it was New York and Oregon passed it in like 1887. But then it was adopted, I think, in June 28th of 1894 by Congress. And I think like 23 states jumped in and then everyone ended up doing it. Um, but there's a lot of Labor Day stats out there that I pulled uh, when preparing my message this morning. And, you know, there seems to be a labor shortage in our marketplace. And it seems to be something that has happened um, because people stopped participating in, in, in employment or now, you know, things have changed with the gig economy. And so they have like side jobs or side hustles and things like that. But it seems like the temporary or the actual nine to five is changed considerably. And from what I've seen, both the unemployment rate is sitting at like 3.5 percent, and the number of unemployed persons sits at 5.8 million. And there was little change uh, in that number over July. Now I picked this actually out of the. I went to the White House website, grabbed this information as of last week, and it shows that the unemployment rate did go up a little bit from 3.4 to 3.7 percent since March. But I will tell you, God has his own labor, his own labor department, and what I mean by that is. You know, tragically, there are far too many unemployed people in this workforce. And however, those who are fearful, who are those who are fruitful, and those who are faithful laborers, the benefit package of working under God is second to none. And so we're going to talk about that. We have an amazing opportunity to steward our job-related powers 
um, and, and have influence in our neighborhoods, in our offices, wherever you work. And so the whole idea is to share God's glory, to share the light of Jesus to everyone in our workplace. And so Christians and work, we, we, we need to think and be different. Okay? We need to think and be different because we're working for Jesus, right? To sum it up, in the biblical worldview, God works. And work is very good. And our calling to work is a very high calling. And all of this is quite countercultural, you know, in this woke world that we live in right now. Um, the implication is that we as Christians will need to do some work to hang on to the unique understanding that of work in the midst of popular culture's misunderstanding of work. We need to recognize that, that we are in a struggle to think and to feel right about work. And work is one of those areas where we have to engage in a disciplined fashion in what Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul said, um, and he reminds us in Romans 12, 2, that is not conforming to the world around us, but being transformed in our thinking by God's word and by his spirit. So don't let this world, don't let this woke culture control you. And so if you'll turn with me in your Bible, let me grab my Bible. Thank you, guys. Um, so we're, we're going to look today at 2 Thessalonians. So it's going to be in the back of the Bible right before Timothy. All right? So we're going to look at 2 Thessalonians, and it's going to, we're going to begin in chapter 3 and verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 6, 2 Thessalonians. But we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat any of anyone's bread free of charge, but we worked with labor and toiled night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we don't have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear there are some who walk among us in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. There is the sermon title. Busybodies. And, and now, those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brother, do not grow weary in doing good. And if any do not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with them, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word today, Second Thessalonians. So Second Thessalonians today... Um, the text really gives us, it helps us to get a sense of what it means to be a Christian and to appreciate the role of work in our lives. Because what was happening in Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians into 2 Thessalonians, the Thessalonians were waiting. They were waiting for the Lord's return, the Lord's coming. They were ready and they were actively waiting for his return. They thought, if Jesus is going to return, why go to work? We're just going to sit and we're going to wait. We're going to sit and we're going to wait. And, you know, I don't need to go to work because Jesus is coming back. So they became lazy Christians, in a sense. And I believe the phrase lazy Christian is kind of an oxymoron. It, you know, it's kind of like jumbo shrimp or pretty ugly or working vacation. You know, I never quite understood those. But a Christian that is ready and actively waiting for the Lord to return cannot be a lazy person. Let me, let me explain this. This was an issue that Paul briefly touched on in 1 Thessalonians, and it would seem that some folks didn't take it to heart. 
They didn't list it in the first letter, in 1 Thessalonians. So Paul concluded his second letter with some very, very strong words about the dangers of laziness and the value of good old-fashioned work. And so, we are to work. The text is clear. We are to work. We are not to be idle. Those who are idle, lazy, slackers are wayward. And notice what Paul gives. He gives a strong order. He says, I command, which follows it up with every brother. So those who are lazy are not living their lives by the way that they have been taught. They become slothful, slackers, idle. And they are this way because they think Jesus is coming back. They think Jesus is coming back. And you heard the phrase, she or he is so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. Well, that's some of the Thessalonian Christians. That's what they were like. But then, you know, sometimes we could be like that too. And so we are to work and we are to follow, you know, to, to follow and to be a good example for others. And Paul, he was a church planner and he told the Christians that they are to follow his example. Not only was Paul a Christian planner, but he was also a tent maker. And what he was, was he, he made tents so he could plant churches. So he was able to, to afford to take care of the mission that he was on. And so he wasn't dependent on others, although he had the right to do so. He didn't want to take advantage of his host. And so he didn't want them to, you know, he... he he wanted to be a model for them, to show the Christian folks what it meant to be a Christian and to be involved in ministry and to work. And Christians are to work. Paul commands this truth that Christians are to work by putting it plainly. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. We are not to be a burden. Before I get, you know, before I really get too deep into this, I want to make it clear that Paul was talking about those who had the ability to work. Those who have the ability to work, but are unwilling to do so. He's not talking about people who are unable to work because of mental or physical uh, illness or anything like that. Believers have the opportunity and the ability to work for their own food, and that's just what you're to do. When Paul is writing this first letter in Timothy, he touches on this same subject. And so, if you're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those in his household he has denied he has denied the faith it is worse than an unbeliever that's powerful and so let's think about that a minute this is a very important topic that he brought up and it must have been quite the problem back in Paul's day he basically says, if you have the ability to work, but instead choose to take advantage of others and, you know, manipulate the system, you are worse than an unbeliever. That's a bold thing to say, but as Paul was directed, he was directed by the Holy Spirit when he said that. And again, please don't understand, don't misunderstand me, okay? We as believers, and as a church... We're to help those in need. And I have to say that as a church, I believe that we do very well in helping others. And you know that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. We're, we're here for those times where, where people need assistance. And, you know, we're living in crazy times today. And so... When we're talking about this, let's talk a minute about those who don't work. Those who don't work and the reason why. Um, so what do they end up doing with their time? Well, as you read in the scripture, 2 Thessalonians, we are not to be busybodies. A busybody gets tangled up in other people's lives. And we are not to be meddling in other people's lives or their affairs. And, you know, what happens is they interfere in the healthy community life. They take rather than give. They're idle, they're lazy, they're slackers. Uh, these are the type of people that don't contribute to the community, but they clutter it. And Paul is showing that, that lazy Christians are a double threat. Here's why. 
Not only are they a burden to the financial stability of the church, but because they weren't working, they seem to have a lot of time on their hands to be a busybody and to meddle and to get into things. And so, you know, the old Greek translation for, for busybody describes people who are who are running around sticking their nose at everywhere in everyone else's business. The busybody is a meddler, a gossip, a troublemaker, a person who sto- stirs up public outrage towards someone or their actions by spreading rumors and malicious gossip. Do you know anyone like this? I'm sure we all do. Chances are These folks that you know probably have too much time on their hands. And Paul says to avoid these kinds of people. And his command to lazy Christians was pretty blunt. I'm using, I want to paraphrase this again. We command them in the name of Jesus Christ to get to work immediately. No excuses, no arguments, and earn their keep. Why? Because God values hard work. God values hard work. And when we are doing when we are working, we are doing good. No one would blame you for, for, for not wanting to make all that you possibly can and work. Let's talk about this a little bit. Because it can be a little bit short sighted if all you're concerned about is the money side of things. Right? You know, if that's the only reason why you're working is to get all the money that you can and simply get paid, you are very short-sighted about what your labor is all about. And, you know, just to kind of preface this a little bit, I know this all too well because many years ago I was downsized and I was unemployed for almost a year, about six months or maybe even more. And I still have somewhere in my wallet Uh, the card that I got from the food bank. So I would never forget that time. And, you know, during that time, what ends up happening is, you know, if you're only concerned about money, you miss those other things in your life. You miss your family coming together. You miss your family being helpful and helping one another. You miss so much. You, You miss God's purpose in everything. And so you're going to miss the blessings that God has in store for you because you see there's more to work than just money. For example, you just think about the fact that you're going to have the privilege of growing in your skills, just like I did when I worked at Weiss. Growing in my skills for later on to use today. But also your abilities and your talents that God gave you to use them for his purpose and for his plan. And think about the fact that God is building character in your life as you face challenges on your job that you would not face any other place. You can't face challenges. You can't face those types of things at home on your couch, right? You have a sense of accomplishment, and therefore that builds a sense of esteem, of confidence. These are things that God built in you. And and think about the fact that you are also building relationships and you're learning how to get along with other people and you're able to encourage them and to be encouraged by them. And and you're making some kind of contribution to life and you're you're shining Jesus' light on them and you're sharing Jesus with them. There is a lot more to work than simply making money. It's an important part. It's a natural part. But there's more to it than that. So looking back at our scriptural verses and our scripture verses this week, Our work actually matters to God. And so when we work, when we honor, when we work, we honor God by supporting our lives and by supporting the gospel. And and Paul knew, Paul knew this all too well. He was a smart man. He knew that laziness was contagious. He knew that this was contagious. And so he didn't want the faithful active members to fall into its traps into, and, and that's why he said, keep away from. And that's why he said, do not associate with. You know, while this person is still your brother, he is to be redeemed. And so we are to help those slackers. We are to encourage them. And, and we are to, to, to be stewards of the gifts and the abilities that God had given us. 
And so if we are able, we are to work because God calls us to work. We're workers. God is a worker. We know we are to work. So what does it mean to work? We are doing what is good. We, when, when we work, we are doing what God wants us to do. We are being faithful to the teachings of Scripture. We are following the example of the apostles. We are working and therefore are able to eat. We are not busybodies because we are too busy for that. We are doing what God, in verse, like, we are doing what is good. And so verse 13, brothers, never tire of doing what is good. This is literally what the text says. By working, by caring for ourselves and for our family, by supporting the work of our church, we are, you are doing good. When we do what is right, what is good, we are encouraged. And even though it may not always be easy, because work is not easy when you're putting in like 8 hours, 12 hours, 16 hour days, it can be so difficult and we may not even realize it, but we are part of a much larger work that God is doing right now. And through this, in our church, in our city, in our nation, in our world, we are doing good for his plan, for his, for his work as Christians. We may fool ourselves to think that, you know, we are depending on God, and so we're just going to lay back, we're just going to be idle, we're going to be lazy, and we're just going to let God provide everything. Don't make God an excuse. Don't make God an excuse. Since we are Christians, we need to work. We can't have that excuse. And so Paul commands the lazy to work. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. He commands them again, telling them that they are to settle down and to earn the bread that they eat. There's no getting around it. God places high priority on work. God prioritizes work, so we are doing good to others and even to ourselves. But, but what then? But then what is this teaching us about work? The text underscores that when we work, we are doing good. This is a biblical concept. The work that our first parents did in the beginning of time was part of what is meant to live and to honor God. When we work, we are doing good. Many Christians today, I've seen it, I've talked to them, have more than one job. They work hard, they care for their families, they raise their kids, and they tie, they give to their church. They, they live their faith in the workplace, and people are attracted to that. Because God gives you this, you know, Jesus gives you this glow, right? And that people want to talk to you. People want to ask, why are you so joyful? Why, you know... Why are you so happy? Talk to me about this. People are attracted to that. They, they, they follow the teaching of Jesus and are examples of those inside and outside the church. And that's what it means to be good. When you're that example to others. And I'm not talking about working your way to heaven. I'm talking about the fruits of the Spirit, the outcome of your faith. And so in Ephesians chapter, it's Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, By for grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Your good works aren't going to get you into heaven. Your good works come from the faith that you have, the belief that you have in Jesus, the changed heart that you have in your life. So don't be a busy body, but be busy. Work may be a challenge, but through it, we're supporting ourselves and we're on in this ongoing success of the gospel, telling others about the love of Jesus Christ and, and what he has for them, that gift he has for them. And Christians need to be an example for others. We want others to be part of the tradition. And, and, and in that text, we refer to that. Through our work, we honor God and those who who worship with us. Our work really matters to God. And we are not to be busybodies, but to be busy at work. When we work, we are doing good. Perhaps you're not understanding the value of work. Maybe as a believer, you're, as a believer you've come to realize that the place 
that you place work in your life in such a unique way. You've gained a new perspective. And even though you may not have been idle, your, your insight into how you view work is now abundantly clear. Now you know that your work matters even more, no matter what it is, no matter if you're door dashing, no matter if you're a nurse, no matter if you're a roofer, whatever it is, you're doing it for God. Your work matters. And so, maybe you're not a believer. And this doesn't matter to you. Maybe it's time that now you finally heard that your work life matters. And that maybe there needs to be a change in your life. And so we're commanded to not be busybodies, but to be busy. There's no room in Scripture for being a, 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 a slug for Jesus. Right? We are to work, and we are to do good work. And so Labor Day comes, but once a year. Many will gather tomorrow for picnics, barbecues, and not even be thinking about work. For Christians, work has much more meaning now because of the richness of the tradition and the teachings that have become a fabric of our lives. We can show others by our lives who Christ is through our work. But what you do at work every day, you can live out your faith. You can share Jesus with so many people. You can plant those seeds. So on Labor Day and every day, you labor. Remember this. When you work, you were doing good. So how was your faith? How was your faith today? If you've decided to follow Jesus, and maybe you've backslidden, or maybe you've fallen away, or you know, maybe you've never even decided to follow Jesus, I encourage you to do that right now. I mean, you're not listening by mistake. It's the most important decision that you're ever going to make in your life. And, you know, it, it says that you, the Bible tells us that our life is but a vapor, appearing only for a short time, and then we pass away. And, you know, when we pass away, we're not guaranteed a second chance to have that personal relationship with Jesus. We had our life to do that. And so this decision is very, very important, and you're not listening today by mistake. You're not watching this message by mistake. There's a peace that we can be with God forever. Our lives are short. And so how can you come to have a relationship with Jesus? What does that look like? What do you need to do? First, a change of mind and a change of heart. You need to turn away from these sins that are taking over your life. And so that means repenting of your sins. That means tearing down that wall that, that has been built up between you and God. And then, you know, I love this. You know, when we're, you know, God gave us free will, so we have this wall built up because we're sinners, right? And then he's like, you know what, I'm going to build a bridge. And that bridge is Jesus. And so what he did is that we need to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we need to go all in for Him. We need to go all in for Him, letting Him take control of our life, every aspect of it. He will be our Lord and Savior. And so you ask Him to come into your life and take total control of it, every aspect. And Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. And what we have earned in this life of sin is is death and, and separation from God. And again, Jesus built that, God built that bridge. He gave us Jesus. That was the gift to save us, to cleanse us. And he said, you know, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, instead of whoever put your name in there, that you who believe in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
So if you want to have a change in your life, if you want to have a new purpose for living, a new joy, a new peace, a new happiness. I mean, our Lord sees the sparrow, sees the sparrow fall. He knows the numbers of the hairs on our heads. He saw us before we were even in the womb. He knows us. He loves us. We don't have to be perfect to come to him. We don't have to be perfect to come to church. His death on the cross, Jesus took all of our wrongs. And if you believe that and you commit to following him, your life will never be the same. And so finally, the Bible says it the most simple, and I love this, the most simple, simple way. The most simple way the Bible can share this with you, that the Lord can share this with you. 1 John 5.13 I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. So maybe you've been adrift. You know, if you know Jesus and you've been adrift, come back to him. It's just like the story of the prodigal son. God is there with his arms open wide waiting for you. He's waiting for you. He will not reject you. And also, if you, if you have a a burden on your heart. If you want to learn more about becoming a church member or if you want to learn more about believer's baptism or if you just have a just this burden, a care on your heart this morning, I invite you to message me down below. Send me a direct message if you want or you can email me at donaldmast at gmail.com or go to our website a1sbc.org and go to contact us and leave us a message. I will contact you. We will pray together. Our church will pray for you. We love you. And so, if you want to learn more about that personal relationship with Jesus, we can definitely help you with that. And so, friends, I want to thank you for listening. And again, we had some technical difficulties this morning at church, so I wanted to share my church message once again with you in hopes that they would plant a seed somewhere in hopes that um, it would draw you nearer to God. And so thank you so much for listening. If you have any prayer requests or uh, a burden on your heart, we are here to help. Have a blessed day. Have a wonderful Labor Day. God bless you. Take care.